Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend, David Quintieri from the Money GPS. We are live here this July 29th. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. Definitely. So yesterday we had, uh, <clears throat> actually two days ago, so we had the uh, kind of interesting Fed meeting. It seemed like uh, you know Powell was kind of trying to be dovish and hoggish at the same time. And we actually saw a huge rally in the markets. Your take on what we've seen, because it's been across the board, it's been precious metals are up, the stock market is up significantly. Um, what is happening right now? So in my personal opinion, we have not gotten anything, what, what they've talked about, you know, the Fed pivot and all this nonsense uh, that hasn't happened at all. I mean, I look into this obsessively at this information that has not happened at all. There is no Fed pivot at this point. They might pivot. But at this point, not the case. So the way I look at it is basically we were way oversold in the short term and the markets are simply using this as a buying opportunity. There have been some, I think, uh, you know, different analysts, Goldman Sachs and others that have basically said 4,000 on the S&P 500 is the lowest it's going to go. Uh, it might chop around those levels, but it's just not going to go any lower. Uh, people just aren't going to be selling. So I think without a real big catalyst of fear that simply the markets are just going to continue buying. They're not worried. Okay, it's a recession. So what? That means the Fed's going to print. Oh, bad news? No worries. Fed's going to print. Like in all situations, the Fed is going to print. So they can get away with a lot more. And I believe personally, despite what many have said, I believe they're going to continue to raise rates for the foreseeable future. We said, I mean, I said it a hundred times before. People would say the Fed's not going to increase. Look, we're at 2.5%. Just, you know, what, a year ago, that was impossible. Okay, here we are right now. So we'll see what happens. But ultimately, you know, just looking at the technical analysis, it was very clear. Too oversold in the short term. Commodities went too far, too fast. And so we have a turnaround. We'll see what happens, though. So it seems like we have seen a turnaround a little bit in the markets. Do you think this is a change of trend? Because I know a lot of people out there are were thinking that, you know, the stock market is going to collapse and everything. We saw a bear market, but it seems like we've been turning around. So your perspective, will we continue lower or just are we going to have this melt up that some people have been predicting? It's so hard to tell. I'll, I'll tell you what the most important factor here is that without the Fed's easy money, you know, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be real difficult, especially to break those previous all-time highs. I mean, that's just a simple matter of fact. What I look at today, uh, most importantly, is when I see garbage stocks and, you know, silly things, I don't even know, you know, like Dogecoin or whatever, no offense to anybody that has Dogecoin, but all these things that have been created and quite frankly, do not deserve the billions and billions of money, dollars that have been thrown at them. Uh, and yet, you know, 2020, okay, fine. Everything was going crazy, but here we are in 2022. And as soon as we have a little bit of a rally, those same exact things go up to me. That tells me fear hasn't hit the markets. You, you know, you see the fear and greed index and the, oh, it's, oh my goodness, we've never seen this much fear before. There's no fear. If they're willing to buy that same garbage, there's no fear in the markets. It's simply a matter of, you know, what I said earlier. And that's just a matter of fact, like um, whether it goes up or not, I mean, it's going to be so difficult, really, truly difficult uh, to get these markets up. Uh, without the Fed support. So I'm not, I'm not sure, like in terms of breaking all-time highs, we can definitely be moving around in these, in these areas. I've noticed um, statistically what I've seen is that um, a lot of the people who are holding shorts have been getting rid of them. So that's just, that's just current information. This is very interesting. People getting rid of shorts right now. So that might signal a trend change here. Um, so it, it, we're here live with David Quintieri. For those just joining us, from the Money GPS, author, author of the Money GPS book. And uh, so I did want to ask you, David, uh, it seems like, yes, there weren't any specific um, words from Powell that uh, say, you know, we're going to pivot, but a lot of people are interpreting it as that, that a pivot could be coming. Do you think a pivot is coming uh, anytime, maybe before the end of the year or shortly after when we go into 2023? It's funny. Um, it's kind of like, 
you know, when people put their fingers in their ears and they just sing to themselves, la, 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 because they don't want to hear it. It's like whatever. He could have said anything. He could have been talking about unicorns and kittens and the market. Oh, oh he, he did he say pivot? OK, let's go with it. I mean, it's just ridiculous, honestly, because there was no wording in there whatsoever to suggest that there would be a pivot. They said, OK, we're going to look at the data and all this. But they've been talking, I mean, forever. As long as I remember Powell being up on stage, he's been using the word data dependent or you know, some variation of that, of that term. And he's careful, doesn't want to suggest that uh, you know, they want to crash the markets. They don't want to scare anybody, spook anybody. But that's the way I see it. Um, I look at this each and every single meeting. I look at every single presentation that they do. I look at all of this. And really, nothing fundamentally has changed. Now, what I noticed was odd was the morning of the Fed meeting, markets had already been in the green. And then usually there's turbulence right around 2 p.m. Uh, but this time it was like green and then more green and then more green. It was, it was an unusual day to say the least. And following Fed meeting days of the last few that we've had, um, they usually go down. That wasn't the case in, in this case here. Uh, so we're just looking at green shoots everywhere. At least that's the way I've been seeing it. Um, but I mean, are they going to pivot at some point? Of course, absolutely. But we haven't seen the devastation and destruction, which is part of what the, you know, the reason the Federal Reserve exists in the first place is to create this destructive uh, business cycle so that they can consume more and more, have their friends, Goldman Sachs, JP, and, and so on, uh, consume more and more. You mentioned how it was a significant move in the markets. I remember um, I did see a recent video you put out that really showed that we haven't really seen this big of a mood move upward in, in the stock market really since March of 2020. Yeah, it's it's been a huge surge because people are seeing it as buying an opportunity. They're saying, hey, the bottom is in, buy the dip, buy the dip. And we're noticing this. I, I just had a stat uh, yesterday I was looking at where the retail buyers are just throwing in their cash into the markets um, at a rate we haven't seen for quite a while. Definitely you know, all throughout this year. Um, so the retail buyer is definitely buying in. But even at this point, as I said, the shorts are leaving, which means now they are finding a lot of their money within, you know, whether it's tech or, or something else, tech is getting bought up really heavily right now. Um, I don't know if that's going to be temporary or not, but certainly markets don't want to believe that the Federal Reserve is going to abandon them. So here we are. It definitely, yeah, it seems like uh, we're in a situation where it is fundamentally changed um, from where we are, where, you know, like 20 years ago, where uh, all eyes are on what the Fed chairman is saying. You know, it's like, how did we get to this point? It seems a very bizarre world. And and even when the Fed, and you know, when Powell doesn't mention the word pivot, you see markets soaring. It, it seems like a very uh, different environment we're in today. I think... Right now, what we're seeing, like, there isn't a particular catalyst and there isn't, you know, that linchpin that's being pulled out, um, you know, something like a subprime crisis or any form of black swan. We don't have that right now. We do have slowness. We do have consumer debt at record levels, credit card usage at record levels. We have student debt in astronomical territory, which will never be paid off. We've got people that likely will not be able to pay their mortgages. We also have, you know, extreme debt loads of all kinds and savings at the rock bottom. All these things are not necessarily catalysts, right? They don't create a, you know, a super event that, you know, we talk about and write books about. This is kind of just, you know, heading towards that, heading towards destruction or, you know, the car off the cliff, wily coyote, whatever you want to think about it as. But um, the way I see it is quite frankly, that um, the longer you kick the can down the road, the worse the pain is going to be. You know, if we just have a period of what I call economic detox, um, we're going to be much better off, but that's not the way it goes, right? They just want to create more pain. Um, so, you know, we didn't get that this time. I'm even believing that, you know, maybe there is a recessionary period that comes in, won't be necessarily that bad, won't be a depression, uh, and maybe they go in the opposite territory and they actually hyperinflate. You know, that would be, that would be extremely devastating. Um, people want this, which is crazy. Uh, 
Uh, they want the central banks to print trillions and trillions of dollars. They want more infrastructure packages. They want public works projects. Uh, and they don't care about the consequences. I mean, just look at China's real estate. Like, do you need any more examples? Do you want your country to be like that, where they build entire empty cities to keep this facade? You don't have, it's okay to rest once in a while. Everybody rests. God rested on the seventh day. I mean, everybody rests, okay? And it's okay to, to take your time and say, okay, now we're not going to grow anymore just for an, you know, another year or two. But that stuff doesn't happen anymore. They just want constant acceleration, you know, have another espresso shot. This stuff doesn't, it doesn't end well. I mean, I've studied history. I've obsessed over it. And unfortunately, people are just going to get burned in the end, whether it's now or 10 years from now. If you, got, if you made a lot more money over a 10-year period because of the Fed's nonsense, it's going to hurt a lot more at the end of the 10 years than it would have right up at the front. I think one thing that you mentioned there is that, you know, the, the Fed and, you know, people running the government want that espresso shot rather than taking things slow, how, you know, how, how we should take them. Um, but it is interesting because the average person, uh, you know, the people watching this video and us as well, you know, can actually step outside of the system and, you know, live our lives without that espresso shot as, as, if we want to. So how do we kind of take a step back and realize that, you know, we're in this crazy financial world, but, you know, we can take a step out and we don't have to live in that, in live in the same way. 100%. The more self-sufficient you are, the less you have to rely on this system. I mean, it's a simple matter of fact. If, you know, just a few things, if you grow a garden in your backyard, well, suddenly you're less reliant on that, you know, uh, the whole you know, supermarkets and the farming and all the agribusiness that has changed our food supply. Um, and not to mention, you know, the health factors there. Um, at the same time, if food prices are going up, but you grow a certain percentage of your own food, that inflation on that food affects you less. Same thing with if you have geothermal heat in your house or geothermal thermal energy in your house, if you have solar panels in your house, whatever's best in your area, if you have a well, if you like all these different things that you can do for preparedness or self-sufficiency, it's like inflation has less of an impact. And I know there are so many examples of people that live in you know, relatively normal environments that you know, they don't pay the prices that we pay because quite frankly, they took the time and they took the investment to put that into different things that are, you know, uh, not necessarily off grid, but more self-sufficient ways of looking at things. And I think it's so smart. And, you know, if they take us to a hyperinflation, it's not us that's doing it, right? It's them. They're the one that's doing it, but we have to be the one to have to bear that burden. And ultimately we got to be smart and look down the road, five years, 10 years, 20 years, whatever the case may be and get prepared today. You recently made a video about how the what the wealthy are doing, and it's it's interesting to um, look at that and say, well, you know, what are the people in the know doing right now, uh, and what are some of the habits that they have, and, and some of the habits is to own real assets. Uh, you mentioned becoming more uh, financially independent, becoming more independent with respect to the food uh, that you uh, have. But can you expand on that? Of how do people actually own real things? Absolutely, yeah. So I think the vast majority of people, they will simply just buy paper assets. A lot of young people, especially, they'll open up a Robinhood account or something similar and they'll buy through there. And uh, they kind of just buy whatever influencers are, are kind of suggesting. Um, but the wealthy don't really do that. Not to say that they don't buy paper assets, um, but their wealth is not kept generationally through paper assets. That, that's uh, actually strange uh, if you look at it. What they do have, all the most wealthiest families, you don't look, like, if you look at the Forbes list, you're looking at the wrong groups, okay, please. You gotta understand the wealthiest families. These, these groups are very intelligent. They've been around hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years uh, and they know exactly what to do. What do they own? They own real estate. They own precious metals. They own, um, you know, fine art. They own fine wine. They have jewelry, fantastic jewelry. They have all these different things. 
But see, because people, they don't know how to even understand that game that they just say, well, I'm just going to go this route. And that's okay to do that, I guess. Um, but you, you know, you, you got to understand your timeline and your timeline isn't, you know, the next six months. Don't, don't try to get rich quick. That just doesn't work out well. It, it hurts a lot eventually. Um, so, you know, but that's what greed does to people. So yeah, you, you know, you got to own something that's tangible, that's real, that holds value beyond your lifespan. Like you got to remember that, like it ha- if it, if it's only going to be around a few years, like who knows? Is, is Amazon, okay, Amazon's the biggest thing today. Will Amazon be around in 50 years? Probably not, okay? But people can't even imagine that. But that's just a matter of fact. Look, it came out in the 90s. Amazon was around in the 90s. Here we are today, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's getting old, okay? But people put so much of their wealth. Now, what happens in the turnaround? I don't know what type of event is gonna make that change. But I can tell you that, there's certain things that exist that will be timeless. They are timeless. And that means, you know, you got to diversify too. You own a little bit of this. You own a little bit of that. Don't, don't ever put all your eggs in one basket, like they say. It is a completely different mindset. As you mentioned, <clears throat> really looking at things on a generational time scale and really preparing for many, many years ahead. Um, I think holding hard assets is one way to do that. I mean, you you purchase, for example, gold and silver coins and you put them away and pass them on to your children. It's a completely different way uh, from looking at the financial world than what we're you know told on uh, the mainstream news when we're talking about, as we did at the beginning of this interview, you know, what the Fed is doing. It can just move the market super fast. The wealthiest in the world are not thinking that way. They're not listening to the noise and, you know, buying stocks, selling stocks. They're they're preparing for generations in the future. And I think that's so key. It's a completely different mindset. Yeah. One point I wanted to add was people look at Warren Buffett and the guy might have, or his comp- Berkshire might have, might have like $150 billion of cash. And all throughout 2020, he was being trampled on. And you were saying... Like this guy, he's holding cash. How can you do this? Peloton is the greatest stock in the world. Uh, Netflix, whatever, right? And I'm, I'm a Dogecoin millionaire and all these things. Um, but guys like Buffett and Templeton and you know any, any of the huge investors, they, what they always had done was they waited until the price was right. And they will just sit there and wait. And why? Why is that the case? I don't think people realize it's not just a numbers game. It's because when you enter a recession, like we might be entering, okay, even if it's not that significant, credit tightens. And this whole financial system and the whole economy relies on that credit to be easy. Suddenly, if it tightens up, oh, oh, we've got a problem because now where's the sources of funding? Business, like what are what are companies, like the reason why the stock market's going up so fast, has gone up so fast is by share buybacks. What are share buybacks funded by? By debt, cheap money. But suddenly if that debt ain't so cheap, well then the whole game stops to continue like this. So, you know, I just think that, you know, there's a time and a place for everything. And if, you know, these guys are just waiting for the right moment, they're going to be there and they're going to just throw down. A guy like Buffett during the financial crisis, Bank of America, he got some sweetheart deal with Bank of America. Why? Because he's their friend. Well, maybe there's some inside stuff there, but more importantly, credit was impossible to get. So Bank of America went to the rich guy and they said, hey, want some really, really good deals on this stuff? He said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And the same thing with so many different companies. It's not the way that people think. They can't do it. People cannot do that. I mean, the majority of people, informed people, like, you know, the viewers of this channel are, uh, but, you know, for the average person, they can't, they can't do it. All right. So any last thoughts for our viewers, David? Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, all, all the people watching today should go to themoneygps.com and also the money GPS on YouTube to check out your work. But any last thoughts for our viewers, what should they be paying attention to uh, going forward? Uh, and what are some of the last final thoughts you had for our viewers? For sure. 
Um, obviously, I'll say it a thousand times, Federal Reserve balance sheet slightly coming down. Look at the global central bank balance sheets. If you want to know on a global level, uh, one of the nicest places to get that is you go to a search engine and you type in Yardeni, Y-A-R-D-E-N-I, and then you type in uh, central bank balance sheets, put that in a search engine, and you'll get uh, Yardeni's latest reports. I think there's a weekly and a monthly where you get the latest reports of all the central banks or the major central banks, and you can kind of track what's been happening. Okay, so that's important. See their balance sheets and are they increasing? Or are they decreasing? At the same time, you want to look at the uh, rates. There's a website called Global Rates where you can see them anywhere necessarily. You, you look around, are rates increasing? Are they decreasing? Or are they, are they being held flat? Right now, at this time on a global scale, we are watching them increasing. If that changes, okay, now we're into. I don't want to call it pivot, but certainly not the same situation that we're in today. Uh, I would also uh, tell people to get your own self-sufficiency under control at least a little bit. If you can grow 5-10% of your food, you are far better than probably all your neighbors, okay? So that's one thing. If you have an alternate source of energy that you can get, like if you live in a sunny place, if you live in California, you live in somewhere else, and you could do solar panels, do it. There's probably so many programs out there that you can get them either on a discount or sometimes even free based on you know the way it works. Um, do that 100%. Can you get a well? Can you harvest water? Like these things might seem a little bit ridiculous to some people, but I'm telling you, those people who are dealing with drought right now might welcome, might have welcomed that water harvesting a little while ago. That's just the way I look at it, okay? If you live in a place that's prone to some sort of disaster, maybe it's not, you know, if it's just always happening, be prepared. I mean, I don't want to tell you to move, but, you know, be prepared. That's all. Being prepared doesn't cost you anything when you think about it. It actually only adds to your life. So that's it. Uh, yeah, like, like Elijah said, if you want to check me out, the money GPS, you search me, you'll find me. Fantastic. And I just also plug for our viewers, um, Joel Salatin. We have a lot of interviews with him uh, and he goes over a lot into gardening and farming. Um, Joel Salatin from Polyface Farm, just search that and Liberty and Finance, you'll find all our interviews with him as well. Uh, you mentioned gardening, so I had to uh, plug him there. But David, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Take care. All right.